Oh, hi, guys. Hey. <laughs> awesome. Hey, Roxy. I see you. Hey. Hello, Pax. Welcome to my story time. He did the thing. It's like your friend Fred Bear. Shout out. Awesome. <laughs> hey, guys. Thank you for being here. Welcome to PAX. My name is Matthew Patrick. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. I, good, I'm glad we're starting off with things that everyone knows. We're starting off and we're gonna build. Uh, my name is Matthew Patrick, better known online as Matt Pat, and I am probably best known online as creating a thing. Uh, and that thing was a bunch of YouTube channels called Game Theory. Film theory, food theory, et cetera. Yeah? Who, who knows game theory? Yeah? NTT Live. Okay, so a couple of you. That's good. <laughs> um, but for those of you who don't know or, or might not be aware, uh, game theory really at its core is founded in my love of gaming and specifically education through gaming, right? So when we would do episodes about things like Minecraft Diamond Armor, and how much Minecraft Diamond Armor would actually be worth. It is an opportunity for me as a content creator to look at this video game that I love, but also talk about, like, hey, gemology, learning about cut, carrot, clarity. Uh, let's talk about how you evaluate a gemstone, cool stuff like that. Or taking a more extreme example, like calling Mario a communist. <laughs> right? <laughs> controversial, controversial stance. Matt Pat, uh, <laughs> it's controversial, but through this video, right, I'm able to talk about really cool topics like political movements and important points in world history, stuff that would otherwise be pretty boring and normal and dry, but because it's told through Mario, it's, it's kind of fun and cool. Or for instance, I could talk about other things, like if I were to talk about... <laughs> we're... <laughs> We're, 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 we're just gonna skip that one. Oh. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> Educational content, ladies and gentlemen. Education takes many forms. Uh, you can learn about a lot of different stuff, uh, about a lot of different body parts. Uh, <laughs> I like that people in the front here are saying, like, we needed the sequel to the boobs episode. You do realize that the Luigi's penis episode was the sequel to the boobs episode. <laughs> Equal opportunity. Uh, at its core, though, right? Suffice it to say, game theory was all about education, and it's the thing that I am most proud of, probably the thing I'm, I'm most known for. But what's been really interesting uh, is as I've kind of closed off my retirement arc here on the channels. Those, for those of you who don't know, I recently handed off the channels to a new set of creators, which, thank you, thank you, yes. <laughs> which I'm, I'm so excited about, and they're doing amazing work, and I'm so proud to watch them grow and, and make it into what they have always envisioned it to be as a, as a new voice of creators. It's, it's great, uh, but the 10 week lead up to that transition has been wonderful to look back on my history on the channels, as a creator, and my history with video games. And for the first time ever, I, I, I came to this realization that every single important moment in my life has been tied to video games in some way. I always knew that I loved video games and that I enjoyed them, but when I actually stopped and looked at what are these pivotal moments in my life, video games were always there which I thought was really interesting. That's one of those things that I wanted to talk about today. Um, and so even in my earliest of early days, right? So uh, that's, that insert obligatory awe here. Uh, th thank you. Um, that's me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, this is not me as a gamer yet. I didn't have enough muscle control in my hands at the time. Uh, <laughs> but as I was digging through old photos to use for this presentation, I'm like, oh, like these are fun. And I especially like the one on the right there right, your left, your left, uh, because it's me practicing my YouTuber react face <laughs> before YouTube became a thing, like, oh, S slap some clickbait green text off to the side there, and you've got yourself like a Mr. Beast thumbnail. Uh, so, <laughs> that's great. Um, but here I am on Christmas morning. I, I, actually, <laughs> I actually love the fact that the two faces are identical to each other. <laughs> like, it's the same face made like a couple years apart. Again, pioneering YouTube thumbnails before YouTube was a thing. Uh, but yeah, you could tell that I was a hardcore gamer guy because I had a Game Gear, which had better graphics uh, than the Game Boy. 
It came in color. You know, so like all the... Uh, right? I know. I was, I was fancy schmancy with that. I know, right? So that was my, that was my earliest memories. And, and even like when you think about what is your first ever core memory as a kid, right? Like what is the first thing that you as a child remember? My first ever memory as a human being, as an, an individual that exists in the world, was video gaming. Uh, specifically, it was me in my childhood home sitting on the floor of, of the house playing Castlevania and uh, fighting Dracula. I was like maybe like six, seven years old at the time, uh, and my mind was blown by this boss battle. For those of you who aren't, uh, you know, half past dead or were born in this millennia, here's a little clip of what it looks like here. So here we go. Final boss. Boom! And his head pops off. It popped off. It's great. It blew my childhood mind. I'm like, oh my gosh! I whipped this guy's head until it popped off. That was that was horror gaming in the 1980s, by the way. That was terrifying. That was not age appropriate for me. <laughs> that was instrumental in my childhood. I whipped him until his head popped off. Although to be fair, for as traumatic as that was for me as a kid, my child, Ollie, he's, he's five years old. He, yeah, shout out to Ollie. <laughs> he asks me not infrequently to recount for him the story of Five Nights at Freddy's. You know. Right, right, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, right? It, it's literally like, oh, let me tell you the story about like the animatronic murder pizza restaurant and the dead kids stuffed inside the suits. We heavily censor what's going on there. Uh, he has these questions about like, why doesn't, why doesn't Glamrock Freddy have his head? And it's like, you and me both, bud, I don't know. <laughs> That's what we're trying to figure out. <laughs> That's what everyone wants. Um, so yes, horror gaming kind of lives with all of us. Um, so that was my earliest memory right there, sitting in the living room playing that game. Uh, but it wasn't just horror and monsters and gore and traumatic uh, childhood memories. Uh, it's also brought me to uh, the partnership with my wife. You know, I met my best friend, my partner, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I met Stephanie through gaming too. So uh, basically we were both in college. Um, and we both were forced to take a math credit, and neither of us wanted to take a math credit, because why would you take a math credit if you didn't have to? And so, <laughs> I like math, no, don't get me wrong, I love math, but it's like, oh, you could take three-dimensional calculus in college, it's like, no one wants that, like, get out of here. And so instead, we had both, we didn't know each other at the time, but we had both independently heard that there was this Easy A course called CompSci4, video game programming. And we're like, oh, easy A plus video games, sign us up. And so, uh, you know, we both signed up for it. And the first day you're always a little bit nervous because you're like, oh, did the older kids like troll me? Is this some sort of hazing thing or whatever? So you're sitting in class and then the professor walks out in his Hawaiian shirt and you're like, oh yeah, easy A course. <laughs> like you could tell, it's not like one of the stuffy professors with the elbow patches and stuff. It's like, oh, he's the Hawaiian shirt guy, this is awesome. Uh, but Stephanie and I have a, uh, a chronic problem called we are broken. Uh, we, you've heard of type A personalities, but we are type A plus personalities. And so while the rest of the class is just coasting through this thing, making video games that are like, press X to win, you know, here's Steph and I competing for the best game in the class every week because they would give out an award. And we're making stuff like five levels of a breakout game. And then at the end, there's like a boss battle. And you're like, a breakout game? Like with balls hitting blocks, having a boss battle? But that is how upset we are. Like, that is how crazy we are. Like, you've heard of the try guys. We are like the try hard guys. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was bad, right? So at the end of the semester, when we had to partner up for the final project, we knew that it made sense for us to, to do it together because we wouldn't let down the other person. We worked hard, right? And so the rest of the class literally did like one whole golf game where the ball goes into the hole and it's like, whoa, cool. Meanwhile, we did something called the Epic of Stew which was, uh, you know, may or may not have been lightly inspired by the original Legend of Zelda. Uh, you might have seen some of our source material. It no longer exists, sadly, because it was programmed in Java, uh, but this is actually taken from the initial PowerPoint presentation that we had to kind of pitch out to the class of what this thing was. Here was the help file. Uh, it was a, like, five-level epic, because, again, true to form, try hard. Five-level epic with scrolling backgrounds based on your movement and multiple ways to attack and eight different enemy types, all with different attack patterns, a multi-phased boss battle, different endings. Like, Eiji Anuma, eat your heart out. <laughs> we did more than a Zelda game does. <laughs> like, really. And, and to cap it all off, the, 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 the craziest thing about it, I think, and, and the thing I'm, I'm most proud of, is at the end of it all, you save the princess from this, like, evil basilisk and then you enter a dating simulation. 
Because it's not just enough to rescue the princess, my friends. You have to woo her too, right? All this talk about, you know, strong female representation in gaming and how do we make it more accessible to me. Epica Stu's been waiting there the whole time, guys. We, we were making that curve happen back in the day. Um, and it's funny, too, because uh, that was our first ever project together. Right, that was the first ever large scale thing that we'd ever worked on together. And we like to say that we've been working on group projects together ever since. You know, where we started with a video game, it became let's let's start a channel together, let's let's get married, start a business together, let's have a kid, and we've been doing all these group projects. But even in our proposal, video games had an impact, right? So while we were really kind of low income, living in New York, I was a starving actor, Steph was a starving college student uh, in grad school, and we could have taken the money that we had saved up to buy a ring for her, which would have been kind of the normal way to do things. Uh, instead, we decided to buy this. <laughs> We bought this, uh, we called it Ruby, because it was red, it was our, or it was our Ruby, and, and then because it was a we, we called it our Ruby Wing. <laughs> I, I make myself sick sometimes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> if any of you puked in the seat, I apologize to the, to the cleanup crew, that is totally valid, that's disgusting. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so that was our Ruby Wing, and we played through all of uh, Kirby's Epic Yarn was our first ever game together. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Nintendo obviously had, had a huge impact in, in my life, right? I, I talked about how uh, Nintendo was my first ever system. We bought this Ruby Wing for our engagement. Uh, it was really foundational. Even my childhood bedroom was all Nintendo themed, right? Like, I remember I had these ugly lime green walls, which uh, suddenly makes me realize that's probably where the green text of all our thumbnails comes from, <laughs> subconsciously seeded in during my childhood uh, very clearly. Um, but we had these lime green walls everywhere, and uh, my Mario was, or sorry, my room was decked out in all this Mario paraphernalia, right? So he had a Mario lamp, he had like a, a Mario thing over here, Mario stuffed animal, and then on my bedspread, just a giant Mario face, just like staring up with his like Italian plumber grin, watching me as I sleep. And in retrospect, it's, it's scary. It was probably my first ever jump scare. Uh, <laughs> again, the childhood trauma starts coming out, and you're like, oh, that's where that came from. <laughs> but yeah, Mario would just stare me in the face the entire time, uh, which is actually one of the reasons why it was is such a huge deal for me personally to have gotten the chance to meet uh, Shigeru Miyamoto uh, during my time as, as host of the channels of Game Theory, right? To be fair, it was for a, a pretty lousy brand deal. Uh, um, I met him for uh, the game Star Fox Zero. Any remember Star Fox Zero? No, you don't. <laughs> No one remembers Star Fox Zero. There's no wooing for Star Fox Zero. It was basically, for those of you who don't know, right, Star Fox Zero was like, hey, you know that franchise that's really good that we don't use at Nintendo all that often? Well, we're giving you a new Star Fox game. And everyone's like, yeah! And then they're like, but hold on, we're Nintendo. We're going to make this virtually unplayable <laughs> by making you use the Wii U control pad as a separate thing. And so now you're watching two screens at once and wow, doesn't it make it so hard to aim? And it's like, yes, this is a terrible game design. You know, here's, here's, the, here's the godfather of, of modern gaming with Pikmin and Star Fox and Donkey Kong and Mario. You know, not everyone's gonna be a winner. <laughs> that, one, that one was not a winner. Um, but I got to meet him as a, a part of this experience uh, to promote Star Fox Zero. And even though the game itself was largely forgettable, my experience with uh, Mr. Miyamoto was not forgettable. One, because I was meeting a childhood hero of mine, just this, this amazing man who I you know, looked up to, loved the work of, and, and was, you know, was, was a god in, in some ways. Uh, so it was unforgettable for that reason. It was also unforgettable because I ghosted him when he tried to give me a high five. The footage I'm about to show you <laughs> cannot leave this room. <laughs> it is, it is, don't, don't leave this room. <laughs> Shut it down. No, the, the footage I'm about to show you will be our little secret, all PAX attendees. I was, I see the cue's over here now, so I pointed a bit too early. But <laughs> it, it won't leave this room. It's going to be our little secret, so, okay. No one's, no one's filming or anything, right? Okay, here we go. Here we go. This is towards the end of the interview. So, thank you for this. Thank you for Star Fox. I, I can't wait to, to play around with it. Awesome, and thank you, sir, as thank well. You. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, sir, as well. May I ask you how you are? You just have to say that you're fine. You're not really fine. Oh, man. Oh, man. 
you know how they say, don't meet your heroes? <laughs> don't meet your heroes, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, not because they're going to disappoint you or they're going to be different than what you expect or the interaction's going to go differently. No, it's because you're going to do something cringe and then that cringe is going to haunt you for the rest of your life. And then maybe one day you upload that cringe to YouTube and then it continues to haunt you for the rest of your life. You don't live it down. Um, to be fair, to be fair, in my defense, I had shaken his hand a couple minutes earlier because, the, the, you know, when you're saying goodbye to people, it, like, carries on. And so I get shaking his hand and the translator was Anyway, it was, it was bad. It was bad. <laughs> it wasn't great. Um, but, uh, but there was only one other person. People ask me all the time what it was like to meet Mr. Miyamoto, right? And, and the answer there is that he, is, he exudes this energy. He exudes a vibrance, like a, a, a joy, a sense of like childhood enthusiasm and curiosity. Like it is palpable. Um, I, I'm sure you've heard the phrase like, oh, they have an X factor. You know, it's something that you can't quite articulate, but you can feel and you can sense. Mr. Mr. Miyamoto, he has that, right? He, you sit in the room and you just are like encapsulated by this like centeredness and self-assuredness. He is one of only two people in my life that I've experienced that with. The other one is this guy. <laughs> the Pope. Uh, and yes, we are going to talk about it. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Why, right, why, why do I do this to myself? Um, so, right, why, why would I give Undertale to the Pope, right? Don't worry, we're going to address it. <laughs> so, um... So for those of you who don't know, or for those of you who successfully blocked it out of your mind, congratulations, thank you. Um, back in 2016, I was tapped to be one of 12 digital influencers, one of 12 digital creators, to go and meet the Pope at the Vatican as part of this like live international conference where he was, it was like meetings of different communities, right? So it was an all-day event where people were coming in to meet him, uh, ask questions, have small group chats with him, and then eventually to present him with a gift. And as some people know, but gift I give him, which we'll talk about. Um, and, the, and the thing is, uh, about the Pope, is uh, people are like, why were you selected? And YouTube's like, oh, because of your educational content that is uplifting and sends a positive message to your fan base. Yeah. Appar apparently they didn't dig too deep into our watch history. <laughs> Like, oh yeah, sure, well, the game theory guy, that's, that's great, whatever, so there he is, Edu educational content, ladies and gentlemen, there it is, educational content at its finest. Um, so yeah, it was, it was this all-day event where 12 of us from different parts of the world were brought in to have this, like, meeting of the minds with the Pope, and it started off with, like, a small little, like, group chat with him. And then eventually it moved on to this, this giant amphitheater here where you see all these different leaders from different charity organizations, different uh, communities, uh, different actors and celebrities and things like that, all there to hear and ask questions and, and do this event with the Pope. It was a big like PR event, right? Uh, and, and just to showcase how weird of a moment in my life this was. Like, so there's me right there. Um, and then literally right down the, the way, a, a couple seats over, was George Clooney. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which some people will recognize, which is, I'm, I'm impressed, because I'm like, do people even know George Clooney at this point? For those of you who don't know, he is, uh, uh, like, a heartthrob actor from back in the day. Uh, yeah, yeah, he is. Super successful. He was, like, the world's sexiest man for a little bit. Um, always in my heart, obviously. Uh, but <laughs> probably best known in this room as the guy who played Batman in, like, in the weird Batman movies where his suit had nipples. Um, so I've labeled him right there. You could see me just like 10 seats over from bat nipples. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and so uh, one of the things that, you know, as, as part of the PAX event, a lot of uh, questions were submitted in. We're going to get to a Q&A after I finish kind of like my pre-prepared presentation here. Uh, but someone submitted a question here. This is from uh, Magic Sword King from Philadelphia. I go to Catholic University. The collective will of all the nuns on campus is telling me to ask you why you gifted the Pope a copy of Undertale and to tell the story of how that happened and what it was like. So I, do you worry, really? It's a small world. That's crazy. That's wild. Um, but it's one of those things where I can't ignore the collective will of all the nuns, right? 
That's a, that's a key demographic for game theory. I don't know if, if in our analytic, YouTube analytics, they break it down into like male, female, international nuns. <laughs> So like, I, I can't let down the nun demographic, right? So, so let's talk about this, right? Um, well, meeting the Pope was very interesting, right? Uh, it was one of those things where, similar to, to Mr. Miyamoto, he exuded that centeredness, right? He exuded that peace and that calm and this like aura of confidence. It was, it was palpable in that room, it was crazy. Meanwhile, me, all I was exuding was a lot of sweat because it was a small, hot room with a lot of cameras and a lot of pressure. You're meeting a world leader, and I'm sweating so bad my suit's sweating. So <laughs> that is what I was exuding during that moment. Um, but Mr. Miyamoto and the Pope, Pope Francis, they, they share other things in common than just beyond like this, this aura, this, this vibe that they give out. Uh, they also share the unique distinction that I have ghosted both of them. And, and, and when I say go, <laughs> dialing me up on the phone, hey, it's the Pope, my papal text. Uh, no, <laughs> no and, and when I say ghost, it's not like I missed the papal high five, although that would be hilarious. It's just the idea of the Pope like rolling up being like, yo, man, go, let's dap. Uh, <laughs> like, yeah, the vestments, let's go. Uh, no, this one, I, I don't know. I don't know if this was worse. I'll let you be the judge, <laughs> honestly. Um, so for those of you, you know, like who, who don't know this, the, the Pope speaks Italian. Um, and so as a part of this event, we're all kind of gathered around this, this table this, in this small room, and we're all taking turns having questions. And you're getting everything pumped in through a translator in your ear. You have a little earpiece, and everyone's hooked up to an individual translator. And sometimes it's on a massive delay, right? Because the Pope's speaking in real time, it's being translated in real time. And so the delay is anywhere between like, 30 seconds to like a minute, sometimes like 15, 20, 30 seconds, minute. Like it, it, it varies, but it can be pretty substantial, right? And so early on in this meeting, in this process, he, the Pope makes a joke about like, oh, I have to keep my answer short and blah, blah, blah. You know, one of those like PC, politically correct, this is an awkward situation for all of us jokes. And, and so me being the try hard that I am and wanting to show that I'm, a, I, you know, I'm the A student and I'm, I'm very attentive and I'm focused and engaged in this conversation, I'm a very reactive listener, right? And so I'm like, ah, ha, ha, ah, good joke, Pope. Ah, ha, you're so funny. YouTube react face in full motion. You know, I've been practicing it for all those years, right? And the Pope turns to me with, a, with an expression of confusion and a little bit of sadness <laughs> in his eyes. And I'm like, oh my God, what have I just done? The stomach just drops, right? I'm like, what have I just done? And here's the thing, like, this could have been like a fraction of a second. It could have been five minutes. Like, I have no idea how long this look lasted, but it felt like an eternity. And I'm like, what did I just do? What has just happened here? And that's when the translator catches up to what he had just said. And what he had just said was a story about small children finding dead bodies on the beaches of Italy. <laughs> yeah, Pope, go on. <laughs> Funny one, Pope. Good one, bud. God, I mean, right? <laughs> It was the delay, Pope Francis. It was the delay. Um, yeah, there I am with my stupid YouTuber face. Like, oh, yeah, no way, cool. Uh, I don't know. It could have, like, I, 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 in my memory, the way I remember this, it was like they were also poverty-stricken orphans. on the, you know, the poverty-stricken orphans on the beaches of Italy. And you're like, no! So anyway, moral of the talk today, if you take nothing else away from what I'm talking about today, it is this. No matter how embarrassed or cringe of a thing that you might have done, don't worry Matt Pat has done you one better. <laughs> Not just one important figure in history, two. <laughs> I need to complete the trifecta. Someone get me on the phone with the president or something. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, no way. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's the Pope story. And it's, it's funny, too, because most people, when they hear me bring up the Pope or whatever, you would expect me to be talking about giving him Undertale, uh, which was the thing that the Internet had feelings about. 
uh, to put it lightly, uh, people had feelings about me giving him uh, a, a Steam code for for Undertale. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know what console he used, guys. I, I didn't, I, right? I, I didn't want to give him something that it wasn't going to be compatible. You didn't get I, I, I didn't get him. I can't be giving him all the versions of Undertale. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's the Pope, but he's like, like you know. No, um, no, but I, I, so I, I, don't worry, I got him the Steam code and I printed it up very nicely and I gave him the login instructions and I put it in a sealed envelope that explained why, you know. But the internet had feelings about this. They're like, why would you ever do this? This is crazy, right? Um, to which I say, I, I feel like the internet maybe lost something in translation on that one. I think when they imagine, oh, giving the Pope a gift, it's like his birthday party or something, right? Where it's like the Pope's opening it up and he's like, oh my gosh, a new crucifix, thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, this is the rosary I always wanted. This is amazing. Thanks, guys. I'm going to bless someone with this. No, like, they were all symbolic gifts, right? You saw that giant room before with the amphitheater. And they're all symbolic gifts uh, to represent individual communities and creators. And so for me, you know, as a representative of, of the gaming community in a lot of ways, I'm like, hey, a game with the theme of solving problems through peace and nonviolence and different groups coming together and, and finding uh, happiness amongst themselves, humans and monsters and this and that, like, that, that's great. I think that's a huge win for this sort of symbolic event, right? And just for my credit, just so I can justify myself in front of the collective room here, as well as the internet or whoever is streaming it at home, to justify other gifts that were given that day. You know, there were some traditional ones like, oh, here's a tree, a tree of peace, or oh, here's a book you can read, I guess. But then there were other ones that were like, hey, here's a surfboard. Because it, it was one of the, like, they were from Hawaii, right? And they, it's like, oh, we'll give him a surfboard. And so, you know, if you're giving me a hard time for giving the Pope a steam code to Undertale, you know, the, the Hawaiian community group that came in are like, yo, 70-year-old Pope man, let's hang 10. Like, you know, six of one, half dozen of the other. Uh, one of the YouTubers in this group actually gave her, uh, or sorry, actually gave the Pope her uh, self-written autobiography <laughs> of the trials and tribulations of becoming a beauty influencer at like 20 years old, you know, so <laughs> to the man who just dropped a story about poverty-stricken orphans finding dead bodies on the beaches of Italy. And so, you know, like, the struggle was not real, sister. Like, <laughs> you know, so I stand by the whole Pope Undertale gift thing there. Just, just want to put it out there, but that answers the question, and I hope that answers the, the question that was submitted and, and all the questions that were submitted around it. Um, but the, the beauty of that whole thing, right, and for as difficult of a time as the internet gave me about it and for all the misunderstandings and headaches and memes that have come out of this, I felt so validated when four years later, this moment happened. <laughs> It all comes full circle, ladies and gentlemen. It was a similar sort of event. Look at that. A circus troupe performs for the Pope at another one of these big PR events. And what do you hear? Megalovania by Toby Fox. There it is. So sure, I might have myself a lifetime of cringe and embarrassment coming off of this thing, but at least there were some good memes that came out of it. <laughs> uh, also, I, I, I've never actually talked about this clip uh, before, uh, but is it just me or does this look like, like a boss arena for a Dark Souls game? <laughs> right? you, you have like the giant ominous statue looming in the background that you know is going to come to life midway through the battle. You have, like, the, the soldier in his full-on uniform. He's going to attack you midway through. And then you have just, like, the Pope watching it on from his throne. It's like, I feel like I have to dodge roll my way out of this thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm too encumbered at this point. Um, anyway, uh, going back and, and moving a little bit away from the Pope. Uh, <laughs> we've talked enough about our papal friend. Um, I, when I say that, like, wow, there are these big achievements in my life that relate back to gaming, you know, yes, there are things like, whoa, I found my wife, or whoa, I started a business, and, and we've created this amazing channel and this amazing business, and, and my kid is growing up learning video games and this and that. But of all of them, biggest achievement, beaten Battletoads.
uh, uh, that, that's my humble brag. I, I, don't get to, I don't get to flex the, like, I beat Battletoads card that often, but I felt like this was a room that would appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> you know, no, and obviously I'm joking, but I'm also not joking. All throughout middle school and high school, like for the first couple of years of high school, I would take summers, uh, uh, weekend nights, and just dedicate myself to grinding away at Battletoads on the NES, and it was terrible, and I hated my life, and I got so mad, but I got through it. And then I did it, and I'm like, yeah, I can do anything. The world is my oyster. I can conquer it all, uh, which gives me such an incredible sense of satisfaction. Now, anytime I see a listicle from BuzzFeed being like, oh, the top 10 hardest games of all time, and I'm like, I beat number eight. That's great. I have to, I have to work my way up to Silver Surfer now. Uh, <laughs> Right, almost. Um, anyone else ever beat Battletoads, by the way? Like, yeah, right? Like, there's like five of you in this giant room, six of you. Yeah, that, right? It's hard. It's brutal, right? Yeah, it's terrible. So, anyway, the, uh, the other thing that I wanted to call out here, and again, going back to this theme of video games being really instrumental in not just big moments in my life, things that I've done, people that I've met, but also just influencing me as an individual. Uh, episode three. Of, uh, of game theory is about this game called Illusion of Gaia. It's a, it's a Super Nintendo game, uh, action-adventure RPG, uh, pretty bog-standard stuff. You go around the world, you compete in a bunch of dungeons, you level up, and eventually you save the world, right, from, from alien destruction. Uh, pretty unremarkable, I think, for a lot of people, largely went under the radar. Uh, but this one game fundamentally shifted so much about who I am as a person and what I've grown up to do in my life, right? So first off, this was the game that first introduced me to Ronnie, who was my first partner on Game Theory. He was our editor for a long time. And he and I bonded. He reached out to me when he saw episode three go up, and he's like, oh my gosh, you know Illusion of Gaia? I didn't think anyone knew that game. And from there, we hopped on the phone for like three hours, just like talking about complete strangers, talking about and bonding over this game. And, you know, that was such an instrumental, foundational person and relationship in my life, but then also not only did it introduce me to people who would be so impactful to me as a person, but it also came with this really cool thing. So Illusion of Gaia was a little bit different, and, and any game developers out there, please take note, because I think this is so cool. It wasn't just, oh, go to Dungeon X, the grass dungeon, and then move on to the ice dungeon, then the fire dungeon, whatever. Every location, or at least a lot of the key locations in the game, were themed around and inspired by real-world locations, right? So, and, and the game itself came packaged with a map that mapped out where you were going and a little bit of the history of each of those locations. So for the first time in my childhood life, I made that connection of like, oh, video games in the real world can interact. And I, and I learned something from this, which would then domino to eventually become game theory. This idea of what if I fuse real life learning with a video game? And it started with that map. And not only did that map influence the projects that I would work on, but it gave me a life goal that I'm still working on pursuing to this very day, where I made it a personal goal to visit every single one of those locations that you play in the game. So that way I could experience those same things. I could have my own video game adventure in real life. And at this point, we've done all of them but one, actually. I'm down to my final one. But, you know, in the game, you visit the Great Wall of China. And so Steph and I went to China and saw the Forbidden City and the Great Wall. You go to uh, Cambodia to explore the ruins of Angkor Wat, which I had never heard of before. I would only have known about it through this game. But it's this amazing temple complex buried in the jungles of Cambodia. And you feel like Indiana Jones when you go there because all these ancient ruins are grown over with these giant trees where the root systems kind of weave through everything. And there's giant Olmec faces everywhere. It's, it's unbelievable. It is the closest you will ever feel to being in a adventure in real life, and I got to experience it, and I learned about it through this game that I played when I was like 10, and it's stuck with me ever since. You know, we went to Egypt and Petra and the Middle East because we wanted to experience the Great Pyramids. Uh, this right here, this is the Nazca Lines in the middle of Peru. Uh, again, one of those very off-the-beaten-track sorts of uh, places where people don't know about it, tends not to appear on listicles, but there are these ancient paintings that exist out in the desert that have been undisturbed for hundreds of years, and you kind of have to drive out to the middle of, of the, the uh, uh, like uh, emptiness of Peru, like just middle of nowhere, kind of, and you hop in a prop plane, tiny like three-seater plane, and you fly up and they do a little aileron roll, because you, not, not a barrel roll, do an aileron roll, and you're like, oh my gosh, and you're holding on for dear life, and you're trying to take photos, and you're trying not to puke, so you can see this from up in the air. And again, I only learned about it through video games, right? And the great thing about it is Illusion of Gaia and that game that I played back then 
influenced my intellectual curiosity. It inspired me to explore and learn more about the world around me. And now that inspired me, and now I can pass that along to Ali. And so we did our most recent one last year, uh, where we went to some Incan ruins to, to show, him, show him that and inspire that same curiosity in him. And so there's one left, we have to do Easter Island, and then I've completed my Illusion of Gaia world tour, which is amazing. <laughs> But the, the, and that kind of brings me to the, the last point that I want to make, or kind of like the, the summary of all of this, right, is that games did that for me. That's the beauty of gaming. It inspired a curiosity and an imagination and a love of life in me. I think nowadays it's really easy to be disillusioned with the games industry. You know, it's, and, and, and rightly so. Games are released half finished. There's a lot of predatory behavior with trying to get your money. Mobile games are literally designed to addict you and squeeze every last dollar to capitalize off of addiction pathways in your brain. There's like unfair compensation and, and, and grind and, and, uh, and just so many things that are, just are not sustainable in this world, right? And, and as games have truly flourished into this like capital I games industry, right? Where it's about ROIs and bottom lines and monetization and microtransactions and things like that. You, you've lost the soul of a lot of it. I, mean, I think it's easy to forget what brought us here in the first place, right? Even for me, you know, who isn't part of that whole machine, but like when you're online grinding out content, when you're, you know, I need to go a couple extra hours on Twitch so that way I get more subs and, and people don't leave me and go to a different stream, or when you're me playing through a new game and I gotta, I gotta rush through it because other people are playing through that game and so I have to rip it apart and find the details and get that theory out right away because you gotta feed the content treadmill. You're even game reviewers, right? You either have to be the best game in the world or the worst game in the world because people don't click on the middle. And so everything has to be divisive. Like, gaming in a lot of ways gets reduced to a paycheck. And you miss out on the creativity and the beauty, the hard work and the love and care that goes into a lot of this, that, that individual artists have done to make these things happen. Earlier this week, I gave Ali a new game. Uh, I gave him Kirby Planet Robobot uh, for the 3DS. Yeah, do you guys know that one? It's, it's, I feel like it was a deep cut. If I'm, okay, great, awesome. Uh, for those of you who don't know, because I, I thought it was kind of a deep cut, uh, basically it's a Kirby game where they give him a Gundam suit. <laughs> Listen, they, they release like three Kirby games a year. You know, like they, they got to figure out new ideas. <laughs> like they're like, oh, what haven't we done with this character yet? Uh, yeah, robots, sure, why not? Kids like robots. Um, and, he, and he does, right? Like Ollie loves robots. He, animatronics, huh? Uh, he, he loves robots, right? He, he draws and creates these amazing imaginative designs of robots with like giant saw blades and spikes and laser swords and it's gonna slice this in half and I really should be concerned about the amount of destruction that my kid wants to pursue in his day-to-day -day life. <laughs> but that is a problem for future MatPat. Today, today we are gonna focus on the joy that that game brought him because I gave it to him, and at first, you know, he's a little skeptical. He's like, oh, I've never done this before. This is new and weird and different. But then he hopped into the Gundam suit, the little mech suit, and his eyes lit up. And he had this moment of like, oh my gosh, this is the best game ever! <laughs> because for the first time, all of these things that he had envisioned in his head, that, you know, he's not gonna be driving a mech suit with giant buzzsaw arms, or at least I hope he doesn't. <laughs> not anytime soon, at least. <laughs> but like all these things that he envisioned in his head, were made a reality through this game. You know, it was wish fulfillment personified. And that, that is the spirit of gaming. And that's the thing, that is the core of all of this. And so as I look back on my time in gaming, as I celebrate with you guys here at PAX, that's the thing that I want to, to leave you with. And that's the message that I want to kind of harp home is take the time to fall in love with gaming again. Take the time to stop and think and look at how beautiful this, this gaming world is, right? The first thing that I did after I uploaded my, my final game theory is play a video game. And I'm, oh, oh, thank you, yes, yeah! I do that all the time. The, no, the, the, the sad reality of it was the game that I played was uh, FNAF Ruin. <laughs> Ollie's choice, not mine. I, I, was try, I was trying to be a good dad. He's like, can we play FNAF Ruin? I'm like, uh, sure, but... <laughs> Who's Vanny? I'm like, don't, don't, please. <laughs> please don't. Van is, is the Vanny network different from Vanny? Just, just stop, man. 
After we played that, though, for a little bit, then I got to play my game, which was Spider-Man 2. And for the first time in the better part of a decade, I was able to just let the game wash over me and enjoy it. And as I swung through New York City, I wasn't worried about the deadline at the end of the week or what evidence can I pull out of this game to create a theory or like, oh my gosh, I need to prove that Miles Morales was the villain the entire time. <laughs> Evil? Question mark in the thumbnail. <laughs> Big arrow pointing at Miles Morales' face and he's like, oh no. YouTuber face. Uh, <laughs> I, I could show him a thing or two. Um, but no, it was, it was the, the world was able to fall away. The cares, the to-do list, everything. And I was able to just immerse myself for the first time in a long time. And it was beautiful. And that was magical, right? And it made me appreciate gaming in a way that I, I haven't been able to in a while because it's been a paycheck. It's been a grind. It's been a content machine. And I've always enjoyed it, for sure. It's been great. But it let me see games in a way that I haven't gotten to see games in a long time before. And so that's the thing. Fall in love with games again because... That's the beauty of this space. You can connect with games, and they'll allow you to find a partner for life, a best friend, uh, you know, a trusted ally. They can traumatize you for life, you know, and, and then you whip Dracula's head off, but it inspires you, you know, a decade or two later to create a show where you can talk to millions of people about the logistics of, like, yeah, but could you whip someone's head off? Like, really? Let's, let's analyze the physics of that whip and see how hard it's hitting the face and what's the, what's the response mechanism of the neck and maybe it'll pop off. You know, it'll allow you to troll the Pope. You know, <laughs> just, just connect over, over a shared community of fun and laughs and memes, right? And sometimes you connect with it in a superficial way by wondering how long Luigi's ding-dong is. <laughs> and... <laughs> And, and, that's, and, the, and, and again, that is the beauty of gaming, my friends, like, because it is so individualized, it is so personalized. You connect with it in your own way and you bond together through it. That is the beauty of gaming. Not Luigi's penis, although I'm sure it's fantastic. Sure, right, I'm sure it's a, a miraculous, right? It's great. But the beauty of gaming is that, but it's also you're able to engage in any way, shape, or form possible. And so that is why I am so grateful for you guys to have me out here today as a part of PAX. Thank you to the, everyone who put this event together. I am so excited. I'm so excited to walk the floors with you guys because I've been wanting to do it for years and finally my schedule has opened up that I can do it with you. So I'm excited to see you out on the show floor. And as always, friends, that's just a story. A pack story! Thanks for watching! It's awesome. And I believe now we have, uh, we have some Q&A session, yeah? There there was a bunch of questions submitted. I think there was like 200 questions submitted. So, you know, just a healthy amount of time. We'll be good. Cool. Here, come on. Also, shout, shout out to the Spamton and Mangle over there. Right? Spamton and Mangle over there? Awesome. So good. You guys are awesome. Cool. Hey. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Veronica Valencia, and I'm so happy to be here with all of you, and especially you, Matt. Thank you. Yeah. I'm excited to be with all of them, too. We, yeah. 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 <laughs> I like that all I have to do is raise my hands, and that's, yeah. that's like the universal symbol <laughs> of like cheer. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Awesome. You guys are the best. I love, I love you all. Phenomenal. You're, you're fantastic. Absolutely phenomenal. You sing me! Sorry. <laughs> you catch on live stream. I love the shirt, though. Good shirt. Uh -huh. So we have a few questions here that, as you mentioned, were submitted by fans online. So thank you to everyone and everyone watching who submitted some questions. And I think we should just get right into it. Sure, absolutely. So our first question comes from Josiah Pedraza. What is your most difficult theory in a research sense? Ooh, in a research, uh, obviously Five Nights at Freddy's. Uh, <laughs> uh, just because you have to rethink it the entire time and there's no clear answers. No, um, 
uh, I would say the one that sticks out in my mind is uh, Chun Li and hurricane uh, or her helicopter legs <laughs> physics because I had to teach myself you know, how, how helicopters work and like downward propulsion and there's different types of helicopters and then you've got side rotors and how do legs function as propellers for a flying device and how far is her split going? And I mean, there was, there was a lot of stuff that went into the science of that one that it took me a couple months of in between work and a day job and all this stuff to kind of wrap my head around like what is all of this and and I was really happy with it and it was one that I had wanted to cover for a really long time but that was one that took a very very long time to research and, and get correct <laughs> another question from Catherine Q after analyzing a multitude of games to try and uncover their mysteries and logistics, yeah. have you ever considered developing a game yourself? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, 100%. Um, so first off, I recognize, I, I function best as a story doctor, I think. I, like, I'm very good at looking at scripts, research, clues, and figuring out possibilities, and figuring out, hey, here are the dots that exist, and extrapolating from there, right? Or looking at uh, like uh, with the dots that are on the table and being like, that dot doesn't make sense. That doesn't like it doesn't gel together, right? So I function really well in someone else's story to help refine it and, and grow and and figure out clues and Easter eggs and things like that. That's that's where I love. Um, that being said, there are absolutely stories that I have after years of studying media, both film, TV, movies, and video games that. I, I, that haven't been told yet, and I think that the audience would really like that. That you know, fans of game theory, and that the community would really want to like sink their teeth into and solve. Um, and so, yeah, I, I've thought about it. It's intimidating because I recognize that it is not my specialty, and so finding a partner uh, or a series of partners or whatever would be very important in that process. Uh, but yeah, I think that we have some cool stories to tell and hopefully later this year I get the chance to kind of focus in on that. Now, now that I'm kind of in my retirement arc and have a little bit more time on my plate to be able to kind of open the door to those discussions and, and make some of those stories happen. Mm -hmm. And as kind of a follow-up, like would there be a particular, a particular character name that you already kind of have in your mind? Ooh, a character name. Stu, yeah, well, I like, I like it. See, there it is. Stu, I, I hadn't thought of it actually. I, I mean, you know, Na I was gonna say Ness. I feel like it has to be there somewhere. You know, there has to be a Ness in there somewhere. And then people are like, well, what? right? It could be Ness the cat. I like that. Uh -huh. Maddie, 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 Patty. Oh, there'll be cameos everywhere. Everyone's cameoing all over the place. Uh -huh. And now our next question comes from Acer Ward. What do you think the world would look like if FNAF never took off? Oh. You mentioned how it changed the world. Yeah, okay. But if it continued without, what games or genres do you think would rule the internet now? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, if the world would look like a FNAF. So, uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know, I, one of my final episodes of Game Theory was all about, like, the domino effect of Five Nights at Freddy's, right? Where, it, it, and I think it's a fascinating story in, like, the butterfly effect, uh, where one thing happens and it dominoes into this massive, sprawling series of, of events. And so with FNAF, it was Scott Cawthon, he was ready to give up. He, none of his games had taken off. He was having a hard time making it financially viable as a job. And so he starts this, he's like, I'm gonna try one last time and that's Five Nights at Freddy's. And boom, 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 boom. And, and now fast forward to today and it has shaped the publishing landscape. It has shaped the uh, indie gaming landscape. It shaped the, the AAA gaming landscape. Like it has shaped uh, you know, movies at this point with the Five Nights at Freddy's movie having such a huge success. So the domino effect has been massive of this one game. Um, so that's what this is in reference to just so everyone has uh, context. Uh, you know, it's interesting. So it says what genres would rule the, the roost mm -hmm. right now. It would still be, it would still be horror. Um, and I think that horror, I mean, you saw with my presentation too, like we as humans are so drawn to spooky, scary stuff. And for us, for a lot of us here, it's Five Nights at Freddy's currently, or, you know, Bendy and the Ink Machines, the Hello Neighbors of the World, this and that. Um, woo, the one guy with Hello Neighbor in the back. <laughs> Yeah, tiny build. Um, but uh, 
But you look at like the indie gaming landscape and, and people love to gravitate towards horror. But even if you look outside, like into the podcast space, you know, you have podcasts like Serial, you have true crime podcasts, things like that. People are so fascinated with murder and mystery and intrigue and the justice system and the, the cruelty that people can do to each other and stuff. And so there's always going to be a market for horror. And especially when you look at, at YouTube, Right, and, and where, because YouTube and Twitch are the two places that people look for gaming content nowadays, right? YouTube is bigger, but Twitch is also big, on the, uh, obviously, on the live streaming side. But those are the predominant two. And you have this interesting collusion of factors all happening together where it has to be thumbnailable, but it also has to be brand safe at this point uh, because otherwise it gets throttled in the algorithm. Um, it has to check all, it has, it has to thumbnail well, it has to be child family friendly. It has to be, there's a lot of things that content has to jump through at this point. Mm -hmm. And so at, if, if, ever, if all the rest of history had kind of gone the same way, it would have been horror and horror would have eventually made its way into what people now consider kitty horror or maybe not mascot horror specifically, where it's like, here's the big cartoon character, or the evil puppet, or the animatronic, or the toy that came to life, or whatever. But it would be something close to it, because that's just the industry that we exist in now. Like, YouTube as the place where people find games has dictated that you can't be bloody and gory, you can't be scary. So the days of, you know, the, the outlasts of the world, or the days of the PTs of the world, and stuff that were, like, really scary, scary, hardcore scares, those are long, not, not long gone, but, like, they would have a harder time picking up momentum just based on how the algorithms operate. And so I think horror would still be ruling the roost and, and shaping things. And I think the horror landscape would look similar. It's just a question of, like, whether it would have gotten all the way to mascot horror. So it, that's, that's my take, which is, which is interesting. FNAF was the first to capitalize it, on it and kind of make those changes happen before the industry was kind of forced in that direction. Yeah. But you look across all the evidence and it all points in this direction, which is really fascinating. But hey, that's <laughs> just our... That's, that's, right, I feel like that was a mini episode, right? That was just like a mini episode happening right there in the moment. I, the game theory. <laughs> Our next question comes from Rowena Sullivan. Despite doing one for all the other main Nintendo franchises, why did you never do a theory on Fire Emblem? Uh, how, how, can I, how can I phrase this in a positive way? Uh, no, 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 because no, uh, uh, I respect you guys and I fear you guys <laughs> I mean like to, to be to be to, to be honest right I, I no, that is I, it's because I respect and fear you guys uh, like I knew that Fire Emblem is a, a huge franchise with a lot of deep and rich lore attached to it and I knew that it was not a franchise that I grew up playing it was not one I was familiar with and for me to catch up with it and to make myself an expert into all the things that I would need to have become an expert in to make a theory about that franchise, especially from a lore perspective. Maybe I could have done a science episode, but especially from a lore perspective, like I just, I did not feel like I would be able to do it justice. And I knew that if I did it wrong, I it, would not, yeah. Yeah, I would not live to, to see the day where I would not hear the end of it, right? And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's one of those things too where when... The, the unfortunate reality of a lot of stuff is even when I would bring on people to help me with research on episodes that I was not an expert on, so like a couple come to mind, like Persona. Um, I did this Persona theory, and I'm like, I really want to do an episode on Persona, but I'm not a person. And we had a guy who was one of our researchers on staff who's like, I love those games. I know them like the back of my hand. And I'm like, good, please do, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, I am the lightning rod of hate. Like, <laughs> if, if you get something wrong, and I, I can't really double check you on this, if you get something wrong, I'll do my best, but like if I, if I get something wrong, at the end of the day, I'm the one who gets the, you know, the trolling online. I'm the one who suffers, and not you, right? I, I'm the, the shield for you. And he's like, oh, I got this, I got this. He did not get this. <laughs> if, is any Persona fans? Any, any people, of you Persona fans, how many of you have seen the game theory on Persona? 
okay? How many of you are fans of the game and the theory? Zero. <laughs> no, no, I got, we got one. One, thank you. But, that, but you're also sitting front and center at this event, which means that you care a lot about me, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for your mercy and grace. I recognize that was a whiff, a swing and a miss, but I didn't know, right, you know, and, mm. and so with Fire Emblem, it functioned a lot of the same way, where there had been a couple times in the history of the channel where I had entrusted someone else to do the deep research that I needed them to do, and then I'm like, okay, I, I trust you, and I'm a triple check, They're like, you got this, you feel good, did you check X, Y, Z, they're like, yeah, 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 and then, <laughs> here it is, internet, and the internet's like, no, and so I think that's, that's why Fire Emblem was, was one that kind of got left on the cutting room floor. We, we've had pitches, and and actually, I have uh, a, a f two full scripts, actually, of Fire Emblem that maybe Tom will be brave enough to do, because he, he does know the franchise better than I do. Um, so he might be brave enough to tackle it, but for me, I'm, I'm just like, I can't, I can't put myself... But you considered as, it. What? But you oh, considered oh, 100%. It. And, and we've, we fielded a bunch of, we fielded a bunch of uh, submissions from, from the writers. Uh, we greenlit a couple pitches. I've read them. Like, I, I polished, polished one where I, I went through and, like, did my pass, re-researched, re-edited things. Like, I, I felt really good about it, but I couldn't validate all the research. And I'm like, I just don't know if we can do it. So those exist. Those are actually very cool, awesome episodes that I think are good. I just... No, I don't know if they would be good for the Fire Emblem audience, so mm. passing the hot potato to Tom over on Game Theory. <laughs> there it is. There you go. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so we have about just enough time for one more yeah. question. Okay, oh, and this okay. question. I'll, I could speed run. I'll speed run. Speed run? Yes. Yeah, All right, let's see how many we can get through. Okay. All right. From... From CC. I like that it's a speed run, and then all of a sudden the question on camera is like this giant paragraph. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay, all right. From CC, if at any time in your career you noticed a decline in productivity or drive, what did you do to combat that, and how did you stay motivated to keep up with the content industry? Uh, immerse yourself in, in all things content. Uh, like, I was constantly inspired by and motivated by the things that I was seeing other people do. And I think that's what really makes a compelling creative product, right, is you look at game theory, and I can look across game theory, and I can tell you exactly who I was watching, what I was watching at that moment in time, because I was creatively inspired by them. And I was m mixing my personality with the memes of the time, the, the trendy content at the time, the jokes and whatever, to, to create a, a really cool, unique show, a really cool final product. And so when I would find myself struggling, a lot of times it was just that motivation of like, I see a cool video, or I play a cool game, or oh, I'm really intrigued by this trailer, and that gave me the, the creative inspiration or the juice that I'm like, that's what I need to do. And even if it isn't like the highest performing video or something that is, maybe it's not super trendy or whatever, it gave me the creative motivation. Like it gave me that creative fulfillment, which then got me into, you know, back into the rhythm, back into the routine. I'm like, okay, I can, I can keep going with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. From Paige, I have a son that's only slightly younger than Ollie, and I know that with a busy life, it can be difficult to balance personal time, family time, and professional time. Yeah. How did you do it for five years, and do you have any regrets about time lost? What oh, would you wow. do differently now that you've been a dad for five I years? I like that, wow, I like that these are the speed run questions. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Do you have any regrets about how you have behaved as a father? <laughs> Big chunky question. Oh, oh boy, wow. Um, okay, how, how do you balance? It is, it is incredibly difficult to balance, and, and becoming a parent changes everything. It, it changes your perspective, it changes how you value your time, it changes how you value family. Um, one of the things I recognize, like, it made me a, a richer, more well-rounded content creator, I think, um, where I had more references to draw from, I had more points of inspiration, I saw games through Ali's eyes, and I was creatively invigorated by that. You know, I, I wanted to talk about the things that he was interested in, like Paw Patrol, <laughs> you know, and we did a lot of stuff on Paw Patrol and, and Dora the Explorer and stuff. Um, but, you know, obviously there's a trade-off. Like, any parent will immediately say that there is, all, like, the trade-off that you have to do in order to spend time at work is, is such a loss, you know? But that's just the reality of, of life, is you can't drop everything and dedicate everything to the, you have to create a life for yourself. You have to create a sustainable income. And so 
that's one of those things that Steph and I, as overachievers and type A personalities, we've had to just kind of grapple with and constantly like check in with ourselves of, we try to make the most of every minute that we have with Ollie when, when we're available and we carve off pieces of our day as much as possible. And it, it's funny too, because our team still works in our basement, right? It's a big basement, but they work in our basement. And, and it's one of those things where Ollie is now part of the team. And so he'll go down and he'll be like, hey team, do you mind if I play Uno in front of all you guys? And, and it's, it's like he has like 12 best friends in his basement, uh, which, is, which is cool, right? And I think him being exposed to our process, uh, being open to our team, learning from them, learning from me, like I'll sit him on the, my lap and I'll edit a video with him and I'll show him like, hey, this is how you edit, this is how you cut. You know, I will work on him like, hey, this is a thumbnail. And so I'm trying to educate him through this whole process and make it as enriching as possible. Um, so you find ways of making it work and you find ways of kind of having it be the best of that situation. Um, yeah, so that's, I, I think that is my long-winded answer of like, are there regrets? Yeah, there's always regrets whenever you're a parent because it's always a trade-off in some capacity, but you, you make do the best you can and every parent's trying to do that. And we're in this weird position where we have a bunch of people in our basement that Ollie can learn from and hang out with and sell goldfish to sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll go down and he'll be like, who wants to buy goldfish? And we'll slip every, don't tell him this, we'll slip everyone like quarters to like pay, to pay Ollie. Oh, I'll take a handful of goldfish, here's 50. And Ollie's like, yeah, look at all the money I made. And we're like, good for you, bud. Entrepreneurship is a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, so that's that. All right. This question is very quick, okay. so let's get through. Okay, sorry, yes. And we can get through it. And your answer is valuable. It says it right here, so we need to. Okay. From Joe Chair. What is your favorite furniture item? <laughs> your favorite furniture Your answer item. is valuable. Uh, <laughs> uh, favorite, favorite furniture item. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> random. Um, I, you, you know, having, you need a chair. <laughs> We need a chair. A chair that like kind of cups you in a little bit, makes you feel yeah. like, like a nice hug and gives you a nice little place to relax. Maybe it swivels a little bit so you get a little of that going on. How would you but, rate the chair uh, this chair, slightly too wide, doesn't <laughs> swivel. Good cuppage though. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very well supported and, and hugged. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I've, 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 I've deserved it, right? Yeah, I've earned this. So no, pack packs your chairs. Like I, I, a solid like seven and a half, eight. Not bad, not bad, not bad. Uh, out of what? See, that's a true theorist asking. Out of what? Good for you. Yes, that's the question. At 10, but like, you know, thank you for cl uh, clarifying. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining here today. Big round of applause for Matt.